for six years uh, to building this uh, public uh, private relationship uh, and bringing lots of amazing humans to New Zealand, like up to like 500 people. And a lot of our uh, home group lead and also our founders and some people are from the uh, EHF uh, community. So it's kind of like a cousin life. And Yosef today, he's gonna share um, uh, from his experience uh, that working with amazing uh, leaders around the world and himself, um, how we can evolve as a founder with uh, growing with the uh, startup together. And uh, there will be uh, interactive sessions that we were just gonna share our experience as well. So I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, over to you, Yosef. Uh, thanks, Songi. Uh, kia ora tato. greetings to you all. Uh, awesome to do this session here. Uh, I'll, I'd love to just share a little bit about myself before we jump in, just so that I have, you have a bit of context. Um, but it would be great to see if um, uh, Ami, Pu Pong, and Preksha can turn on the cameras if you can, if that's possible, just so that we can actually look at human faces um, as this will be interactive session. Oh, oh thank, thanks so much. You guys are so beautiful. <laughs> you should turn on your camera all the time. <laughs> um, so uh, a, a little bit of myself. So I'm originally from Ethiopia. I'm an entrepreneur myself. Um, and have been uh, working on this project called the Edmund Hillary Fellowship and designing a new immigration program uh, for the last six and a half years focused on impact entrepreneurs. Um, and a huge part of my life has also been kind of bridging uh, business and impact closer together. And sometimes there are tensions that happen between them and sometimes there's a lot of synergy. So uh, a lot of useful lessons in that front and, and kind of like building a, a startup from the bottom up um, with big clients and lots of stakeholders and lots of people and lots of attention. And, and it's been amazing to kind of like grow it to uh, where it's at right now with 533 fellows that we have right now um, from all countries, many countries around the world and from some of the, the top entrepreneurs in the world that we have, such as um, uh, Naval Ravi Khan, for example, who built AngelList and, and others is one of our fellows, great, great founders from parts of Asia uh, uh, who are investors and, and entrepreneurs. So it's been really cool to kind of learn a lot from those people, but also practice in, in building EHF from the ground up. So that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, we'll get a chance to get to know each other a lot more and intimately if you're open to it. So uh, just expect there'll be a lot of space for that. Uh, the today's session is about growing yourself as a founder so that you can grow your venture. And I know some of us here are not the founders, but have joined the teams and we're all kind of entrepreneurs in this work. So um, that's, that's really the theme. And we kind of put a blurb there around how do you become your own best asset and as opposed to a liability for your own venture and how do you kind of invest in yourself on that front? Um, but before I jump in, it would be really useful to know uh, what made you all say yes and show up to this session here. What are you hoping this would be? Um, if you if you don't mind just writing, in, you know, one or two lines in the chat just to share with everyone in terms of what what is it that actually drew you to this? Don't press enter yet. Just just write it there, and I'll and I'll tell you when to press enter, just so that we can see everybody's thinking. Sorry, right. I secondly, I mean, secondly, enter, uh, pressed enter. No problem at all. <laughs> are you, are the rest of you ready? Yeah, if you're ready, show me your thumbs up here. Cool, yeah. yeah I think a few people still need a little bit more time. Alrighty, if you're ready, three, two, one, press enter. Uh, Eves, good to see your face here. Thank you. So, 
Roshan wrote, my company is growing. I want to make sure I'm the best person to lead the growing company. Mm. Awesome question. Resilience, adaptivity, learning to use strengths. Finding the right investors and partners. Yeah, just being a good leader. Um, yeah. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So yeah, we'll we'll dive into it. We won't be able to do full justice to the topic in just 15 minutes, but I hope this session will give us a bit of a chance to uh, um, at least have a framework to think about it. Um, so just uh, I'll, I'll brief, I'll give a brief overview, and then we're going to jump to the interactive part. If that's okay. Um, so to me, being an entrepreneur is like paving a road while running on it. You know, you see you're building a road while you're walking on it. You don't have a road that's built for you and you're not just sitting and building a road by itself. You know, you're doing both at the same time. So it's just, it's a lot of pressure. You're turning an idea and a vision to reality. Um, and I will just share my screen here um, to walk you through just a few ideas that, that I have and that I've learned. Um, so, the main one of the main things that you know being an entrepreneur you learn quite fast but it'll take you a long time to realize is that there are actually three entities in your work there's you the individual and then there's you and the venture which actually kind of has its own entity and and its own set of identity and then there's the venture and the three of you interact with each other but you're actually separate beings. And so just keep the fact that there are three entities in mind and you wanna nurture all three of them. You can't just nurture one or, or the other. And there are different times when one entity is the dominant entity and, and the other one is the less dominant entity. And, and you'll see this kind of happening at different stages of your startup journey. Um, so that's that's really one key thing. It's just there. This is the three entities. Keep, keep those in mind. And when we jump into the discussion, like you know, you'll be asking yourself, "Am I talking about me? Am I talking about me and the venture? Or are you talking about just the venture?" Um, so that's 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 one key takeaway for you guys to to have. And when you think about yourself, you know, just what are the things that exist? What are the assets that exist within you? So there's your story, your background, the experiences that you come with your personal well-being, and that's actually something you are responsible for. It's not um, something you outsource to anyone. Your own networks that you come to the startup with, um, your own management style, communication style, and so many other things that, that come with you. Um, and then there's like you and the venture, and that's a quite a unique entity, which is actually a shared story between you and, and the venture. When you're going out and pitching and promoting and doing business development and selling, there's always an aspect of you embedded within it, right? The, the, even the founding story and, and why it came to be and, and where things are at. And by building your venture, you learn a lot of new experiences. So you get shaped by the venture and you shape the venture. So there's, there's that dichotomy relationship there. And then there are the values and the culture, which you get to define but you're defined by as well. And, and if you're a founder of the organization, um, the values that you embody, not the values that you write in your website, but the values that you as a person embody um, is actually very present. And, and I don't know if many of you were there in yesterday's talk with Joshua Wild, but he spoke about you being the, you're the culture, right? Uh, and so, you know, there's that relationship there and there's the success of it and, and you co-evolve together. So there's, there's a lot of sort of like mixed things within that entity. And then there's the venture. Um, the venture has its own natural cycle. Um, it starts from an idea, it becomes a thing, it grows however long it grows, it peaks and then it dies. Pretty much everything dies at some point, um, be it in three months, be it in five years, be it in 50 years, 100 years, whatever timeline it is, all ventures, all projects die. You can sell your venture and it turns into something else. And what that means is the venture that you started is not there anymore. It's a new thing. Um, 
So you get you actually kind of need to accept that as a as, as a founder and a builder of of an organization. Then there are the investor needs and the team needs and the market needs, which are quite unique to the venture. So all these three different entities kind of relate to each other in in their own ways. And I guess as a founder, one of the biggest things that I I have learned in actually the hard way is um, identifying myself quite a lot with only just one or the other. Um, I, I'd be very curious just to ask here um, and just hear from you all and how many of you have identified yourself with your ventures? Like I am my venture, my venture is me. Okay. Um, how many of you have like people seen you on the streets and looked at you and was like, oh, you are the, the person who does this and like, even projected your venture onto you and your work. Has that happened to you? Um, and, and, and how many of you feel like, you know, you're always dedicated and working for your venture. That's like part of your life day to day. Yeah. So it, it, it it's very consumer, right? So it's, it's hard to actually know where to draw the boundary and, and, and it doesn't have to be like a, a brick wall boundary, um, but, but there gotta be some level of boundary between those three entities. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Um, going back to, to our slides here, I guess the, before we jump in, um, you know, the other thing I just wanna say is as, as a founder and, and a builder, um, there are all these different voices and, and needs and demands that you have on you and they can be scattered and coming at different times. You spoke about you are the culture. Um, you've been throwing a lot of feedback and ideas. I'm sure you're getting a lot today and you know during the Impact Collective program and your team will be sharing feedback on it as well and you gotta act on it. Um, you're evolving with your venture as well as the venture grows you, you evolve with it as well um, you learn about your own blind spots um, how many of you know what blind spots are like do, do you all get a sense so when, when you're driving and there's the the glass that you have the, the mirror that you have in the side mirrors right there's always a spot that the mirrors don't show you and you ha always have to turn your head depending which side of the road you're driving to see that spot and you have to look for that and sometimes if you make a mistake there might be another car or a human or someone um, you know and, and we all have blind spots and that's just part of being natural life and, and and being a founder you have to be aware of that part and and how do you build that awareness um, we're executing fast but bringing everyone else along the journey as well and we've got to hire 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 there are lots of pressures to hire great people and and, and that makes part of your success or failure. There are founder dynamics, investors and boards and leading growth. So um, it, it can be sometimes quite overwhelming. Like how many of you feel overwhelmed sometimes by the work that you do? Okay, most, most of us here. I feel overwhelmed a lot of times <laughs> in the work that I do. And when you're showing up, you're kind of like asked to even wear a mask and you know, just keep going, right? You, you, you got it and you, 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 get, you get to show up fully with, with all the things that you have. So um, anyways, those, those are the, the different things that, that, that are in play around us. So I'll, I'll pause here and, um, and start to ask you, uh, you know, a few questions that I just love to hear, you know, with the raised hands, but, but also if you don't mind, I'd love to ask a bunch of us to share our own experiences because we actually learn most by understanding from our own individual experiences here. Um, so one, one question is, um, look, who here has had, you know, your venture take big operational changes um, that has asked you to change your style and how you lead your organization? So how many of you have had your organization change really fast in some way, be it scaling or you've hired a lot of people or you moved or market changes that has forced you to change your own style? Just show me, show me your hands. That has happened for you. Great. Um, so trying to find names here. Um, yes, sir. 
Yeah, so Ria said, if you don't mind sharing with us what, what that instant was, and uh, if you can give me a brief, that would be great, but what was the change that was happening in your organization, and how did you adapt your own style? Okay, so um, uh, initially when we started back in 2018, we were just a team of four people, um, uh, but, but uh, we, we were trying to um, cater to a very huge segment in Bangladesh, women, and, and, and we're trying to solve their transportation problem. But we actually did not realize that um, very soon we'll have to hire so many people and we'll have to, uh, as the business grows, we'll have to cater to more and more people. So initially I actually used to uh, be involved in all the activities, like everything, operations, uh, uh, marketing, branding, finance, everything. But very soon I realized that I cannot do, do it anymore because there are like so much work and I have to delegate. So that was a, 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 a change of style for me. I, I had to make a change, a huge change in my style because I had to be, become a person who, who can rely on other people rather than taking responsibility himself and making sure everything goes according to the plan. So that was a big change, I would say. And, uh, and, and then even now, um, uh, now the main, uh, main area that I'm focusing on is on fundraising for the last uh, four months. So during this period, I actually stopped being involved in the operation uh, almost um, uh, at all. So, uh, so that was another change. Um, uh, so right now my core focus is on fundraising and maintaining a relationship with existing and potential investors. So I think uh, as the organization grows, our role changes as well. So this is something that I want to learn on how I can continuously adapt myself because I know that in the next two and three, uh, two to three years, there will be more big, bigger changes if we keep growing. So uh, that is exactly the reason I actually joined the session. And I always believe that uh, anyone who has a good idea or a good vision can start a company. But then uh, the challenge is uh, becoming, uh, uh, being the right person to lead the organization at different stages of, uh, of, of the company. So that is why I want to focus on developing and improving my skills and make sure yeah. that as the company is evolving, I'm evolving as well. Yeah. So if I interrupt you there, as, so you say that you are fundraising now. And so what was the transition like from being 100% in operation to then drop it, do you just drop it all and say, all right, guys, I'm doing fundraising, don't yeah. talk to me. What, what was happening that actually yeah. walked through it and what worked and what didn't? So it, it was actually very difficult uh, because um, uh, um, my team is used to me taking all the decisions. Uh, so suddenly uh, when I stopped uh, taking the decisions and I, get, I delegated them, um, so it, it took some time for them to get used to it. It also took some time for me to be satisfied with whatever decisions they are taking. They might not be the best decisions all the time, but still they are probably the, uh, that, that is, this is probably the best way to go about it and mo moving forward. Yeah. So, what, was so the that, hardest, what was the hardest part for you to, yeah, delegate decision-making? How, how do you decide even what decisions to delegate and what decisions to keep to yourself? I actually, uh, um, department wise, I actually divided the work. For example, if it's related to operation, I decided that I'll not be taking any calls. I might be giving suggestions, but I'll, I'll, I'll not be the responsible person who takes the decision because sometimes when I take the decision, our team has to wait for me to get back to them and it actually delays the entire process. So based on the departments, we divided which decisions will be taken by whom. So if it's uh, related to operations, I might be giving suggestions, but I don't take uh, decisions anymore. So, uh, so that is how we divide it. Yeah. yeah, and uh, how did the team react? Like, how, how did the team take that on when you said, okay, now you're making all these decisions, and I'm not, and you came here because you yeah. saw me as a founder, and yeah. now you don't look at me for decisions, you do it yourself. So, so the team was actually very excited and they were, they, they were completely fine with it. But uh, it was me actually who was afraid of, uh, uh, I mean, delegating the work. So initially I was skeptical about how the, the decisions will be taken and if they are going to be right or wrong. But I think over the last three months I've built, uh, uh, my team has, uh, I mean, have been working on it and have, they have taken several decisions and I'm, I already have certain level of trust in them. So it's better now and it's only getting better every day. If you don't mind me asking, what, what were you most afraid of? 
I, I was afraid of uh, uh, taking decisions that are not aligned with the company goals that are not uh, that are something that I, I do not um, uh, like or I, I might feel not be the right decision for the long term of the long term vision of the company. Probably they might be uh, regular decisions uh, and not have any impact on the short term. But I was always afraid that this might the decisions that we take today might affect us in the long run. So that is something that I'm always uh, a bit afraid of. Yeah. And so how did the day to day activity that you do, not the fundraising, but the activity that you do with the team change when you outsource, when you delegated decision making to others? I think like it, what, it really, what, what role did you start playing with the team that you yeah, were not so, playing before? So firstly, I think the process got a lot faster because they don't have to wait for me to make decisions. And then uh, the way I manage it is I, I, I actually uh, have meetings with my co-founders every single day. So uh, the, um, the, the COO, Chief Operating Officer and the CTO. So I, uh, they actually directly report to me and I have sessions with them every day to, uh, to get to know about everything that is happening. And sometimes when, when necessary, I also uh, directly talk to the operations manager, executives and senior executives as well but not as before, but I, and, but as I mentioned, I talk to them, I give them suggestions, but I don't take the decisions anymore. Um, if, if I feel something, I actually talk to my uh, co-founders first and let them take the decisions and I share them my opinion. Got it. Th th thanks so much, Reset. I appreciate hearing, hearing this. Um, who, who else had an organization change quite fast and you had to evolve your style and your approach to leadership. I saw earlier army, army raise your hands. Not army, but Amy. Hi. Hi. Um, actually, I have to say that I probably was the, the change um, in a company because I was hired about uh, two months earlier and I think because local like was basically a social enterprise and um, for myself I'm coming from the corporate world so I'm working in a very different style so I'm trying to implement a lot of things that I think um, like startup usually doesn't do it like for example doing uh, projection and budget and keeping tight close on a cost reduction and looking up um, all the expenses so I think I was pretty much um, changing the culture of the company um, to be a little bit more um, the kind of corporate side but I think it's what the investor needs and what the banks want to see and I think it's probably at the end of the day you know it would help uh, the company grow in a more sustainable way but I know it has a lot of challenges because um, the people in the company are just not used to it so for them to actually trying to do budget like annual budget for the first time or doing forecast and especially during COVID time um, which is uh, quite tough for our business because we are in the tourism business and everything shut down. So um, all the revenue from the, um, during April just suddenly disappeared. So that was quite a big change to suddenly switch to uh, e-commerce, like to sell products instead of selling tours and doing um, community development. So I think that was quite a big change um, for the company and everyone just have to adapt quickly. Um, I think what my uh, personal fear is probably is if my team would probably be able to adapt quick enough to adjust to the environment and to the needs of the investor and what the banks, you know, require us to do. Because for us right now, you know, to secure the loan, talk to the bank and talk to the investors, um, having like proper documentations and having like solid projection is really important. And for us to keep the commitment and making sure that all the projects finish in time, it's also quite a rush right now because our projects suddenly all stopped during COVID. And now everything is such in a rush to finish. We have to finish everything in Q4, which um, is, is quite a challenge right now for the company. So I think um, that's probably the most challenging for us right now. But um, I think our, our team is still um, keeping quite like spirit high. Um, you saw my teammate today, just joined today. So Yves was in charge. Um, he's actually in charge of our um, product side, um, developing food products with the local communities and looking at the overall operation side as well. So um, I think maybe he can share as well, like, you know, from his side, because I think um, it will be good to hear from him too, if maybe you can share. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll try to share with, hi, hi everyone, my name is Eve. 
It, well, actually, we've been through the very tough situation together with Kunemi. As he say, uh, as he just said before, we have changed a lot, and she's the one who helped us to change a lot. And I think it's quite in a good way, but it's still tough to change the team in a very short time. You know, from from the other side to the other side of the world. I mean, means to them a lot. But anyway, we've been through a lot of things. We we still we still can figure it out the way to go. You know, I. Yeah, this is I can share for this moment. Yeah, I think maybe if you can share about like you know what the company did during COVID time during April because I think it's quite a complete shift. All right. right. Um, as as Kunemi just said that um, we're struggling with the COVID period, and we are the tourism company, and you know for me I'm the kitchen side, I'm the operation side, and then it stuck, it stopped actually. Then we try to to find a new business model, like like to start off the the ingredients or anything that we can do. Like we we start off the ingredients from the north of Thailand, and then we cook it, and then we deliver it to the you know the people all around the Bangkok or even like near the Bangkok. Even we do like travel online, like we we just call them as we have you now. We put them on Zoom, and then we just like. Okay, hey everybody, this is the people from the communities and then they are your guide tour for today. And then let them walk through the, you know, the route that being there, but the, the, you know, the guests cannot be in there. So then you are yeah. to take them to an online to do something to, to make, you know, to maintain them, to, to be ready when everything is yeah. done or the new norm is real, you know. And yeah. it, it, uh, proof a lot that you know we still have a lots of model to to find to all. Or, yeah, or hey, it's, I'm I'm curious to hear when did you internally know that you've had to change a huge part of the business, <clears throat> and when did you actually take the action? Well, actually, it's quite fast because we we have. A lots of report, you know, the news report, and then we have a lots of rumors about, and then suddenly they shut down the Bangkok, so all of the, you know, the head of the office, the HOD, the CEO, every management people just like mm -hmm. make a conference call, and then okay, we have to do a lots of things, otherwise our baby is gonna, you know, flow with the, the COVID, so then. We just split everything out and then we share and then we yeah. reveal everything. Then we reduce that. Okay, we are the people who work with the communities and then the community, mm. they got attacked a lot because there's no case over there. So at least they can, they can, they can send us from, um, I mean, the ingredients or do anything from this side with the time period that, that the government control about to control the COVID thing. So then, okay. We we got the answer. We're gonna yeah. do something that send it to our guests. Yeah, and the from the local array to local array. Yeah. So this means delivery, and also good. We got the new model business. Okay, then we send the beautiful local food to the people at home. Let them enjoy yeah. it in that home. And also we do some fine stuff like we put everything in a very nice basket. Mm -hmm. um, to the communities and then we send them as the delivery too. So then let them experience with the, you know, the um, explanation, how to enjoy with yeah. that, uh, the description. We, we, we have this kind of function when we have, you know, yes. the normal period and then yeah. we cannot do it. So then we send the experience to them with the same. Awesome. The, th thanks for sharing that. Is, um, so th th that's a useful example of um, basically the outside world changes radically fast in a black and white way and you either adapt or die. And, and your story is that of, okay, we're just gonna adapt and do what we have to do in this case here. Um, I'm curious to hear if anyone has an example of a major change that, um, it might not be sort of that drastic, but something that is actually less obvious upfront, but, You've, you've had to navigate through 
a change in your organization um, as, as, a, as one of the leaders of the organization. Does anyone have an experience of that? Can you say the question once again? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, has anyone here had experience where your organization <clears throat> basically changed in, in, in a significant way operationally, um, team-wise, your focus, your direction, that has asked you to change your style as well? Um, that, was not, uh, uh, a little, that was not forced from outside in a clear way? something that was not super obvious up front. Does that make sense? Yeah, can I add a point here? Sure. Yeah, so um, uh, previously I talked about how the company grew and uh, what change that required uh, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the growth of the company. But um, uh, during the COVID, we actually um, uh, became uh, we, we transitioned from a B2C company to a B2B company. So that was a huge change for us because we, uh, we had all, all the expertise to succeed in the B2C segment because we have been catering to the individual clients for two and a half years. But, uh, but, uh, but right now, we, we, have, we, we are having to focus on B2B and uh, we are having to build a sales team and none of the existing team members had previous experiences of B2B sales. So uh, me being the CEO, I, act, I also didn't have any idea how to become successful in, and close, uh, close B2B deals. So that is why we had to change our focus and onboard a few new people in the last mm. few months. And we are still struggling and we're still trying to establish that brand and start trying to um, uh, uh, make sure that we have the most efficient way to close B2B deals and onboard new clients. Got it. Got it. So um, one thing I'd say is, uh, how many of you have been running your venture for a year or longer? Raise your hand here. Um, how many of you have been running it for two years or longer? Um, okay, so basically your organization, your venture is gonna keep evolving and changing in its own way. And as, a founder, as a leader of the organization, a huge part of your work is actually looking for patterns. Um, if there's one thing you kind of like boil down the, the work that you do beyond just the daily operations, trying to lead something, is you're always looking for patterns. What are, what are the patterns that are meaningful here? And then you translate what you learn from that pattern into a set of action, right? And so the one thing that is hard with identifying patterns is you don't identify it when you're always deeply sweep into the day-to-day -day operations. So you're kind of like jumping in, swimming in the ocean through the waves and finding a way to, to step aside for a little bit of time to see it from the bird's eye view and look for any patterns that you can pick. And the more you're able to identify patterns, then you're able to see new types of changes that the organization needs like hmm, I feel like we're growing in this area and we need to hire someone. If you're doing things always like quite late, then you're always playing catch up. Um, and that's operationally. But you as a leader in your own style, um, I think one of the things that I've learned is um, you actually need to evolve and change your own leadership before you have to. If you're having to change afterwards, then you're actually not leading, you're always responding to the needs of the organization. And so when you get that bird's eye perspective, you, you, you gotta think about, okay, what, are, what is the leader that the next version of this work needs me to be? Uh, you bring in an executive, even before you bring an executive and you identify, hey, we need a, an executive in this area, you kind of, okay, my decision-making is gonna change when this happens. So how do I, adopt and change my own style in a way that actually helps me meet the needs of the organization in that phase. So that's, that's one key takeaway sort of as you co-evolve with the organization. Um, and we talk about change, change, right? So what are the things you wanna remain constant and what are the things that are changeable? And this kind of comes to culture and values and identity. And um, the more time you spend up front around, no matter what happens in this organization, 
like this list of five, 10 things are things I just don't want to change. I want them to be consistent. Because to actually do change effectively, you got to have things that are consistent or else you are, un you are unpredictable and no one can actually predict how you make decisions. Like board members or investors won't be able to trust you well. Customers won't be able to trust you. So you got to have things that are going to stay consistent no matter what for you to be able to make you know, valuable changes around it. Um, one thing that, another thing that I learned about sort of navigating organizational changes is celebration. And when something is coming to a natural end or a natural transition, actually celebrating the last chapter and saying, great, we've come to this turning point. Or like we used to be three, now we're gonna be six. Let us celebrate the three of us and the version of this company when it was just the three of us. What you're doing in that phase is actually acknowledging to everyone through the, use, through the tool of celebration. And even if it's tough, it's like, you know, you've, you've, you've had to lay off some people in a terrible scenario. Have a thank you period of time to say thank you. Hey, we've made it all this far and the future is not what I want it to be, but it's changing. So let us celebrate how far we've come. And what those things allow you to do is actually create a, a, a turning point because you want everyone else to come along whatever new version you're jumping into. I hope some of it is, is useful. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts around that topic before we change gears? Kapai, okay, I see the thumbs up there. Um, the other bit is, um, I'm curious to hear if how many of you have had, have heard, um, received feedback from others around one thing that has actually been consistent. So if, you, if your team members or externals have given you feedback um, on something that other people have also given you feedback on the same thing. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's, there, there's a pattern there. I, I, I just love to, if, if anyone wants to share, um, if, if you feel called to share, like what was that feedback about? And yeah, how, uh, how, how long period of time have you been? I think Georgia, you, you want to speak, go for yeah, it. Yeah, hi. Um, so at Greenback, we've had an interesting road and I love what you said so far, thank you. Um, about culture, especially like as a founder um, coming into this business, it's been really interesting to watch our culture evolve. And one of the things that I've received feedback for and my co-founder as well is that no matter how our business changes our values and what we're trying to do and our mission doesn't falter so that makes it really easy when you're bringing people on or when we're kind of pivoting which we've had to do in COVID like most people um, that's something we get feedback on and that's what brings people to our team so as I evolve as a leader I like to always remember like where we stand and this whole ICC thing the biggest thing has been learning how to bring that into team culture because we've also grown massively and not only people saying oh yeah we really appreciate that value but how do I actually um, share that with other people so like you say creating like celebration rituals and also creating sharing tools that, that we can kind of share what inspires us and where those values come from has been really important for us so yeah well, okay, what are one of your values that you care most about? Um, I think regenerating nature on planet Earth and being part of celebrating biodiversity and remaining true to that key goal because our overarching umbrella is um, creating tech solutions for climate action and it's so broad, but our primary focus and the products that we're trying to create now we're just retaining that as a core value so we can kind of focus our energy and people come to us and that's kind of what's brought people on board is that kind of steadfast um, desire to make the planet better like most people here have as well as part of their core business. But yeah. Mm. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, is there anyone else who is willing to share about um, feedback you've received consistently or, you know, multiple times about something people wanted to see differently? Men? Um, actually, I was kind of uh, trying to be a listener because my story is kind of 
different uh, style because, uh, well, while you guys were talking about how that you guys can be a better person and like better uh, founders and stuff, uh, in our team, uh, me personally, I was uh, uh, hearing a word we need to focus on like the thing that has to be done like basics because uh what the problems that we had was our company is uh uh making a life jacket and we're on a uh, progress of getting a certification and this progress is like one of the hardest challenges I mean, challenge for us and like the, the money wise and like, like we have to learn and we have to like find out what's the rule for every single uh, uh, countries and stuff. So while we were working on this, one of my co-founder and me myself were having a hard time like uh, use being a person, like we were so energetic about uh, our job and we wanted to like push everything like put everything for this job but it was really hard like working as a life share member and being as a person like Mingan Kim as a like living life and concentrating like between this two was like so hard because every like a lot of things were going on like not only about the business so what I heard from my uh, co-founder was Hey, I know that it's really hard, like not only because of the COVID, but also there were a lot of problems. So he told me not I know that you're having a hard time, but what we have to focus on is we have to believe and believe ourselves that this is the way that we should go through. And so that we need to show uh, to the society and any like worldwidely that this is really important problem and we have to show them that we can solve this problem later on. So we have to like be more faithful and like mm. don't get so depressed and stuff. And I, I was the person who uh, do the job like when I have energy, like I have like super potential but when I don't have energy, like I, I don't like do work really well. So yeah. he was telling me, hey, you need to be like average. Like you need to have that energy like averagely so you don't go down just like you just go up. And mm. and because of this corona thing, like we called I don't I don't know if you guys call it as a corona blue. Like you you know like feeling bad because like you can't meet people and like you can't go anywhere yeah. like you feel bad like we he told me that I need to go through with this and I'm working on this and I I think we're going yeah. to run really well yeah thanks thanks for sharing that man and I think the beauty of having co-founders is that you've helped fill different gaps and getting the right co-founders up front is one of the biggest decisions you make because you can cover a lot of your shared blind spots through that experience. So th th thanks for sharing that. Um, and, and I think a big part of what you touched upon, Min, is actually going to um, the, the first slide that we had here, which is the separation between you, you, and your venture, and your venture. Um, and I think that's where you had an influence on you and your venture quite, quite a lot. And the venture had to adapt to you or like other co-founders had to adapt to where you're at. Um, so that's, that's something, you know, uh, we'd love, we're just two minutes uh, away from finishing up. So we'd love for us to kind of reflect back on that and like, you know, recognize that there are these three entities that you want to keep investing in all of them um, and you want to nurture in all of them. In the earlier stages, there's, there's a lot more emphasis on you. Um, and, and you and your venture and so much of your venture becomes you and the, the, the bigger and better the organization becomes and the organization gets a much bigger life of itself than you. And you got to adapt to keep evolving to those needs. Um, and you got to invest in your own growth um, so you can be the greatest asset of the venture. And, and a huge part of your work is 
identifying the patterns and acting on them. Um, when you're talking about culture, your work is also building patterns and keeping them going. Um, and, and you build patterns by consistency. So you, when you make decisions in a consistent way, then people start to see that. When you start to celebrate certain things, then you make that a sign of success. When you look down on certain behaviors, then you make that um, a front upon behavior and that behavior stops reducing the organization. So a huge part of the patterns you build becomes a huge part of the culture. That's why Josh yesterday said, you are the culture in the organization. Um, and, and yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's building a startup is, um, is, is, is a fun ride and everything keeps evolving and changing. And so um, you, you're swimming and you got to find a way to step outside so that you can identify patterns from far away. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is find groups like this of, with other entrepreneurs. Ideally, some entrepreneurs who are at different stages of the entrepreneurial journey and then have space where you can reflect and talk through your own experiences going through it. How do you make decisions? How do you hire people? Because doing your work can be extremely lonely. Um, and it's lonely because you're oftentimes looking two, three, four steps ahead from where everyone else is at and you're trying to bring everyone else along. And that makes it really lonely. Um, and you're seeing a huge part of the organization that few other people see. And, and, and that makes things lonely. So the more you find other people to talk to and to process what you're going through, the, the more it can take you to that bird's eye view so you can have a, a bit of a look from far away. Anyways, I'll, I'll stop here. I know we're out of time here, but I hope this has been useful. Um, if there is, sorry, if there's one word uh, um, or one takeaway that you have from this session, uh, if you don't mind just typing it in the chat here, that would be super helpful before we, we step away. So one word or one line of, of the biggest takeaway that, that you're uh, um, going away with from this session. Uh,